The basic concepts and design aids that you might run into if you're looking to design uh, tile drainage systems. And uh, so we'll start off with, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen this picture before, uh, Gary Sands uh, group at the University of Minnesota created this years ago, but basically it gets across to say the right idea that drainage pipes are tile buried in the ground uh, to control the water table. You got saturated water uh, soil and you're trying to control the water table so the crop can grow at its uh, maximum ability. And you've probably seen this one before, but this just illustrates it. And, and Hans will hit more on this later. But really, you're, you want to keep that water table at a level where the crop has the opportunity to fully develop its root zone, get access to all the nutrients and water that's available in that that uh, area and then uh, be able to grow better. And, and that's the whole purpose of subsurface drainage is to alleviate these problems of, of high water table. So just to give everybody a, a basic idea, uh, elevated water tables are due to some kind of a restricted layer down here. Water will sit on top of it. Uh, but there is always some seepage through that layer. It's very slow. But uh, what happens if it starts to rain, obviously you get runoff, but you get infiltration. Uh, and the water table will start rising because the amount infiltrating exceeds the amount that's that slow seepage underneath. Um, so. And that water table can rise up to near the surface, depending on how much rain you get and over how much time. And so that's that's where the problems come in. So uh, I just wanted to show you how water flows in the tile, at least up here in the Red River Valley, what we've noticed. Uh, and where this comes from is that uh, uh, Hans in his research plots has observation wells and quite often in late July, August and September, the water table is well below the tile drains. Uh, those two black dots you see there are tile. Uh, and we've uh, had other research sites uh, up and down the valley which show the same thing. So typically what we see is that uh, by early September, the water table, because the crop uses so much water, is uh, well below the tile and there's no flow. But if it starts to rain, uh, like it did in 2019, the fall of 2019, uh, pretty soon the water table starts rising. And you see that kind of light blue, what I've got above the dark blue, that's what we call the capillary fringe. It's not quite saturated soil and, wa and, uh, and water doesn't quite flow into the tile. It's only when that, that actually saturated water table rises up above the, into the tile that it starts flowing. And then the tile starts flowing and you get a mound between them obviously because water is, is uh, it's draining out the water water table is still rising from the infiltration. And actually, if you look at the flow from the center here over to the tile, it, it flows into the tile. Research has shown that over 70% of the water that enters tile comes in through the lower half of the tile. So that's what's happening. And then if it keeps raining and infiltrating, the mound can grow up and get up near the surface. So from a design point of view, what we're trying to do is for a given amount of water that may infiltrate, we want to set this distance so that during, if you ever get those high flow conditions, that the water table doesn't get up right up to the surface and drowned out the roots of the crops that might be between the tile. 
of course, if you stop raining, stop infiltrating, the water table drops down. And in 2019, as we went into the winter, into December, this is where the water table was sitting because uh, it was down even with the tile and there was no crop using water. So it was all primed for the next uh, to growing season for the next spring. So that gives you kind of a broad uh, cartoonish view of how water might flow in the tile as we see it here. And so it, just to um, give you an uh, example, I pulled this uh, diagram out of a, a, a Iowa State bulletin Experiment Station Bulletin from 1911 showing, I'll point up here, they got two transects that they put across this field. System one, system two, and these black lines here are all observation wells in between. They had quite a few. And then the tile is here, the tile lines, and you can see there. So on April 13th, uh, the, the water table was at where the blue line is showing. And then on April 14th and April 18th, they got rain, a total of about 1.65 inches on this site. And on April 19th, when they measured it, the red line shows you where the water table is at. So you can see uh, in system two up here, where the tile is quite a ways away, water table was almost near the surface. But here in between, it rose up to within a foot, within a foot. And you can even see that here's a road and there's a ditch and there's some drainage off here. So when they went back the next day on April 20th, whoops, that's the green line. You can see that almost all the way across, it had dropped almost a foot except over here by the ditch, excuse me. So that's kind of backs up what I just showed you that that's kind of how tile responds to rainfall events. And that's what we see here too, is that um, tile generally responds to rainfall events. There's some exceptions to that, but generally that's true for almost all systems. So if you look at the water balance, uh, I got a pie chart here. If you took a field and uh, measured all the water into it over the year, you know, the, this would be the total amount of rainfall and soil moisture that had been there. The green is the amount that you would lose with a crop during the summer during evaporation and transpiration. The yellow would be surface runoff from rainfall events, and then you'd always have some seepage down below. But if you tile that same field, what we've noticed is that the evaporation and transpiration actually increases a little bit, takes a little bit bigger part, part of the pie. And now you can see that subsurface drainage uh, is lots of times is almost equal to the surface runoff. Of course, that depends on the severity of the storm and so forth. But generally what we found is that if if you say you got 20 inches of rain, you might lose an inch to deep seep reach. You might have, uh, during the course of a growing season, you might, you might see 17, 18 inches go up through the crop, and then you might see two inches go out surface runoff, two go out through the subsurface drainage. That's what we've observed in some of our uh, monitoring up here. And to kind of show you what, what happens with tile and surface runoff. Uh, this was a field that we'd monitored for four years. And this is in October 25th. Now the crop's dead. I mean, it's been frozen. It's not using any water. So the red here kind of shows the rainfall amounts as it received over a 30 hour period. So you can see the surface runoff parallel along and then when we got this second spike here, it really took off and dropped off. So 
uh, a couple of days later, the surface runoff had, uh, from the field that is, had basically go down, gone down to zero. That doesn't mean the ditch receiving it is 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 uh, going down because lots of times uh, you got more than one field feeding a, a uh, drainage ditch. But but look at where the tile. This is actually measured values here. The runoff was modeled, but this is actually measured tile flow. You can see about the time the surface runoff started, the tile flow peaked from that rainfall amount, but it never did get above, uh, I think it was 700 gallons a minute was coming out of that tile on the, this 142 acre field. And if I look out over all the way to thanks, almost to Thanksgiving, the tile kept flowing. We didn't receive any more rain, but you can see it kept flowing and flowing and flowing all the way out to for quite a bit. And so when I add up all that flow compared to the surface runoff, turns out they're both about the same. Quite an interesting fact, but again, tile, the flow coming out is very low compared to what runs off the field. So that kind of sets us up to at least understand tile drainage. Um, so the procedures and tools that you would go through is you would, what I'd say for any design is you, you got to do preliminary site evaluation. Now, fortunately, we have a lot of online tools available that allow us to do this in our uh, office. And there's also paper resources. Uh, uh, primarily what I'm talking about there is you got published soil, uh, county soil surveys, but you could look at the soils. You can determine what drainage coefficient you want. Uh, and why I put that in there is say you're out uh, west of Jamestown, you might use a quarter of an inch drainage coefficient. And I'll explain that in more detail later. Uh, but in the Red River Valley, you might use three eighths. If you're in Southern Minnesota, or parts of Wisconsin, you might use a half an inch. It all depends on how much rain you get. So that drainage coefficient is something that you can select and you can play with in, in uh, setting up some of the, uh, how to go about designing it. And then of course you can get topographic features. Some of that is available online. Um, and then I always say that you can't do tile right unless you get a field and site visit, uh, visit with the landowners. And there you develop uh, more detailed topographic maps. In particular, the, the drains, the outlet, the actual elevation of the outlet uh, may not be what shows up on your paper topographic maps. Uh, especially using LIDAR. Um, and then once you have all that information, then you can start looking around at how you do a tile layout uh, on that field, selecting your tile grades, your tile spacing, tile sizing. Um, I got to tell you right up front, it's been our experience, there's no one right way to tile a field. There are many different ways to tackle it. Uh, some ways are better than others. It all depends on, on the field situation and, and some of the installation uh, requirements. So, so let's start with uh, soils. And I don't know how many of you have ever seen this. This is called a USDA soil triangle. Across here, we have the percent sand going from zero to 100% the percent clay going from zero to 100% and then the percent silt. So if you take any of these percentages and uh, you can come up with these soil types. So you can see we got sand, loamy sand, sandy loams, and they might have over 50% sand, 20% clay, get sandy clay loams, sandy clays. And the reason I bring this up is that in tile, what we're really afraid of is uh, with standard uh, plastic tile that's perforated, 
it can handle clay soils. And the rule of thumb is 30% clay, anything more than 30% clay at the depth that you put the tile is, uh, you could probably, you can use normally perforated pipe, but if you get less than 30% and you get a higher clay content, uh, sand content, and sand is the real, fine sand is the real culprit here, that can pose problems and you might have to specify uh, using a sock or a fine slot in those areas. Now, not all fuels are created equal and they're not the same all over. So that's why the soils information is extremely important. So I usually look at this triangle here is this is where you would definitely need sock. And as you get farther out here, you that would really depend on, on the soils in that field. But anytime you get a lot of you got a tile sand, you're probably going to have to have some kind of a uh, a blockage on the a fine slot or a, a, a sock on the tile. It's an added expense for the sock, but it may, in order for this thing to be a long term investment, it need it's needed. So. I think Hans will talk a little more about this, but basically if you took a soil column and you filled it all up with water, it would be totally saturated. Everything, all the pores in here would be full of water. And then if you could pull a slot here and let it drain naturally, it would uh, drain down to what we call field capacity. That's the ability of the soil to hold water against the pull of gravity and that is primarily the water that crops use for, uh, for their uh, production. And they, it's a, as you can see in the picture here, it's a combination of water being held by soil, but you also got openings in here where you might have oxygen and soil air as, as the soil scientists might call it. And that's what the, the crop needs both air and water in order to grow uh, ideally. If you were to let it drain all the way, if, if the crop sucked all the water out, you'd eventually get down to a wilting point. That's the point at which the crop can't pull any more out, but there's still water in there. Uh, and the only way to get rid of that is to dry it out in an oven or in, in a desert, you might say. So that would be oven dry. So this is plant available water, and that's not what we're draining. What we're after but that gravitational water where after it goes out through drain tile is this water. It's from saturation down to field capacity. And that can change on soil type, but this is, we're not affecting the plant's growing condition. What we're doing is taking out this excess water that takes away that soil air and just causes problems for plants to, to grow properly. So, Hans has made a real nice water holding demo on YouTube. I'm not gonna go to that. I don't think we have enough time, but basically he uses a sponge. Hans uses a sponge to kind of show that you can wear that, you can fill the sponge up with water and then it won't, it'll drain down to a certain point, but then when you squeeze it to let what's left over. So, so we will we will share this uh, link on the resource material that we will give. Just quickly want to know how many uh, of you we have about uh, a third of you that have voted. So wait a little bit till we have the majority. So we know oh that's good. We have a lot of active farmers with us, crop consultants, employees, others. All right, it helps us to uh, to understand uh, kind of what audience we have today. Great, I'm seeing. We have about uh, 70 voted, so I will just end the polling here. And uh, so the results are that we have uh, at least 50% active farmer. We have uh, some farm operators that have retired, agribusiness, public employee, wonderful. So the majority of you are uh, not working for a company. So we will uh, kind of keep that in mind as we continue. So thank you for sharing, Tom, you can continue. Okay. I want to cover some of the important soil parameters that affect the flow of water through the soil to the tile. And one of them is the saturated hydraulic conductivity. In the old days, some people would have known it might have been 
introduced to this as permeability, but really it's a, we use a term called KSAT and you'll see this in publications and everything. And K, the, there's an old uh, Frenchman named uh, Darcy who was the first one to really develop this equation showing uh, what that uh, saturated hydraulic conductivity is. And what it is is a measure of how well the water can flow through the soil in a horizontal direction under a, a different head. So in this case, this is kind of a picture of his, of his uh, early experiment. He had a horizontal uh, cylinder that he filled up with soil and he had added water here. It flowed through and then it would flow through here. And then based on the different, he could adjust the elevation he could then, he knew the area in here and he knew the length of this thing. And, and then based on that, he could calculate the flow rate and he could measure the flow rate. So based on a number of experiments, he came up with this KSAT value, which is intrinsic to the soil that you have in there. And this is very important because this is what helps, we have to have this value to determine what spacing we wanna use for a given soil type in the field. So. Um, if you look at a picture of uh, like I following what I showed earlier about water in between the tile, you might have water up here and a water level might be here. So you got a head differential from here to here. So the water is going to flow downhill just like it does anywhere else, any difference in head. So it's flowing this way and then enters the tile. So you can see the, uh, how the, the Darcy's law is related to tile flow. So we're dealing with horizontal flow and believe me, Darcy's law is also used in a lot of groundwater modeling for wells and other things. You're, that's KSAT. And what I did is I went through the literature to find out what these values are over a range of soil types. So if we start up here, look at coarse sand, the bar shows the range of values that I found. It's usually around 50 feet per day that'll go through coarse sands. And if you go, as you go down through loamy sands, you can see that by the time you get down here, it's about one foot per day that the water will flow through on, on a silt loam. And silt, clay loam, and sandy clay loams all have about that same value, somewhere around one or a little less than one. And then when you get to the to the real fine, the, the sandy clays or the silty clays or even the clays, you can see now you're down about 0 0.06 feet per day, which is pretty slow. So the slower the water moves, probably the closer together your tile have to be in order to drain out the same amount of water given all other things being equal. So this, this kind of gives you a range of these KSET values based on soil type. And down the very bottom, I don't know why I put it in here, but peat and muck have a wide, wide range and designing a tile system for peat or muck is a whole different uh, activity and I, we don't have time to cover it here. So I'm gonna just stay talking about mineral soils and not, not these organic soils. So you can get field level soils information off the web now. Uh, as I mentioned, you got, we got county soil survey books. A lot of them are getting pretty old, uh, but more, you can go to the NRCS. In the US, you can go to the web soil survey and you can go to any field and you can get the latest information. Uh, you can zoom right down to your field and get uh, a whole a lot of soils information. I tend to, uh, I use that sometimes for, for more detail, but I use a Google Earth overlay called Soil Web. Um, Google Earth Pro is free. You can download it and you can then get uh, a, a file, an overlay called soilweb.kmz from the California Soil Resources uh, website. 
I've got the website here. And this is in that list of, uh, of uh, links that uh, Hans mentioned that uh, we have that on a separate sheet that will be sent to you. And then for Ag Canada, I found that uh, they have soil surveys, but they haven't digitized them uh, that I know of. And, but you can go to this site and you can get their uh, uh, access to these um, paper copies and they're in PDF form. And in Manitoba, you can, uh, you can get them there. So just to show you the, the Canadian version, here's uh, for the Morden Winkler area, straight north of Walhalla. You can go into there and then within this book, they have a table of estimated engineering properties of soils. So over here, you can see the soil series name, like a Winkler clay. And if you look over here, here's the disturbed hydraulic conductivity in inches per hour. You can see it varies by depth from 0.05 to 0.1. Uh, if we were to put the tile down at this le level, you know, you might use a, a KSAT of 0.03 or something like that, if this is all the information you got. Uh, in contrast to that, you can look up here, this, this uh, flying field uh, loam, you can see the estimated down uh, this 48 inches. So down, if you were down in this range, you'd be two to three. So you got different case sets for different soil types. And that would then affect what spacing you might have. So that information is available. And like I said, I already had this up once before. But what I'm gonna do is share my screen again and then I'll bring up an example here. This is a site uh, south of Fargo. Uh, a gentleman actually contacted me, but he had, as you can see, he has some water problems on here. And so if this were a site that you were doing some preliminary investigation, this is on Google Earth Pro. Here's the, over here is that soil web. If I click it on, it'll turn on. And this is exactly the same information that you would get uh, from web soil survey because they're tapped into exactly the same database. So one of the nice things, the reason I like Google Earth Pro for some of this evaluation. So let's see, I click on this soil here. It shows that it's a Glinden loam, slightly saline, stratified, and 75% is Glinden, but you got some Mantador Tiffany in here. So if I click on here, it'll bring up this. And then I can look at this Glinden since that's the majority of the soil in there. And it gives you a, a lot of information that you can look at. But if you go down here, what they've done real nicely is they showed the variation by depth down to 200 centimeters or two meters, a little over six feet. Although the NRCS usually only samples down to about five. But you can quickly see here the percent sand uh, KSAT, you can see that it varies. It's uh, it's a uh, above ten, and then it increases. And this might be the depth that you put the tile. So this this where you might be interested in looking at uh, uh, at the. You can see the percent sand content goes way up. So and the clay content goes way down. So if you're putting a tile in at three feet, which is about 100 centimeters, you probably have to have sock in this part of the field. Now, the nice thing is you can click on this and you can get a table that shows all of those. So uh, here I've got the depth and range and I can look at the percent sand and you can see from 71, it's about 81%. It's less than that underneath percent clay, and then you can look at the KSAT values. So here you definitely have two different KSATs, one up here and one down here. Yeah, so it's a, to me, it's a really nice feature. So 
Um, so I'll go back to that and then you click on this button up here and we'll go back to Google Earth. So if we wanted to look at this soil real quick, you can do the same thing. It's a Colvin silty clay loam. It's about 84% of this Colvin. If I bring that up and look at the Colvin, now you see that uh, the percent sand is pretty standard at seven all the way down, percent clay is 28. KSAT is very low. So quite a difference just in that one field. And that's one of the reasons I kind of like this is that you can quickly look at fields and soils and get a pretty good idea of what the variation is across that field and with depth. So let's go on with uh, this drainage coefficient. I talked about this earlier. The drainage coefficient is a design. It's a depth of water that you remove from the soil in 24 hours. So typically with field crops, we talk about good surface drainage. You might It might be a quarter to a half an inch for field crops, high value crops, it might be a higher just because you want to, vegetables and other things are more sensitive to excess water, you might want to get it out of there faster. Um, but the drainage coefficient is a design point. What I mean by that is it's going to be used to design the carrying capacity of the tile to remove a certain amount of water in a certain amount of time. And that doesn't mean that the tile always flows at that amount. This is the maximum design point. So to give you some idea, the maximum flow from tile outlet, if you designed at a quarter inch drainage coefficient, that would be a quarter inch per acre. That would remove about in a 24 hour period about, if it was flowing at maximum capacity at about 6,800 gallons a minute, uh, 6,800 gallons total, or about 4.7 gallons per minute per acre. So if you had 100 acres, you could expect that the flow coming out would be about 470 gallons a minute. If you designed at 3 eighths of an inch drainage coefficient, then you would be about 10,000 gallons would flow out. Uh, and that'd be about seven gallons a minute. A half inch drainage coefficient would be about nine and a half gallons per minute. And this, the drainage coefficient is very important because if you have to put in a lift station, this is one of the basics of design for lift stations. So, uh, so whatever drainage coefficient you select based on, a lot of it is based on how much rain you get uh, in your area as to which one you would pick to design on. So just to give you some idea, this is a site in Richland County, 142 acres. This was in 2010, a very wet year. I think uh, between April 22nd and November 18th, we received 25 inches, over 25 inches of rain, almost 26. And you can see the fall, we had a lot of rain. And that's when we had our maximum flow coming out. But it peaked at about 500,000 gallons a day coming out of the tile. But if you looked at it in terms of what's the drainage coefficient, at a quarter inch drainage coefficient, this 142 acre field should have been draining about 966,000 gallons. So we didn't even get, we were probably draining at about an eighth of an inch drainage coefficient. And three eighths, this system was designed for a three eighths inch drainage coefficient. and was actually one and a half million gallons a day would come out if it flowed at that. But over four years, we never saw this site do that. And this is exactly the same graph, but just to give you some idea of this is the estimated daily water use removed out of that 4,200 acre, 142 acres by corn uh, over the growing season. So started pulling it. They were able that year planted in April, harvested in, in and you can see in this one day, it, it pulled out almost 1.4 million gallons of water. The crop did. It's a real good growing day. And of course, you can see some of the weather patterns come in here. You had days when it goes real low and this is not unusual. 
but just backs up that pie graph I showed you earlier where the most of the water removed out of the soil is going up through transpiration and evaporation. So LIDAR is light detection and ranging. Uh, more and more places it basically describe it, they fly over an area, usually this time of year where there's no leaves on the trees and they shoot millions of laser pulses at the ground and then they reflect back and they're able to record them. And then based on that, they can get, they can make topographic maps for large areas. So in the Red River Basin, uh, they have a LIDAR viewer where you could go to to look at fields. Minnesota has theirs, uh, has their site. Uh, you can also download their files. In North Dakota, a lot of theirs has been is uh, on the State Water Commission website in the LIDAR. And again, I'm not real from, I know that Canada has some available. I'm just not familiar enough to know where you would find that. But this is a, uh, almost as soon as this became available, a lot of our tile installers started downloading this and, and fitting it right into their uh, software packages so that they could uh, superimpose this on top of their, uh, as part of their design guides. Tom, there was one question. How oh. does drainage coefficient relate to KSET? Oh, there's uh, the drainage coefficient is an engineering design point, and it is used to size the tile, the carrying capacity of the tile of the pipe. The KSAT is a measure of how water moves through the soil to the tile. So they're not related really in any way, uh, but both of them are used in as part of the design process. Is, is that good? So I would say KSAT is more intrinsic to the soil types that are in the field. The drainage coefficient is the value you select for your area and rainfall patterns to use to, to size the tile so that the water that flows in, it carries it away. I hope that, anyway, uh, so, to go on, here's a topographic map of an area, um, actually one of our former county agents, it's one of his fields, but I went to the, uh, to the Red River Valley site and, and I was able to pull this up and you can see that, uh, well, let's take the top of his field here. You can see the drainage patterns going down. They go down this way, up at the top it's, uh, Take that over, it's 1,490 feet. This is 1,488. So those are two foot increments. So you can see it gets down to 1,480, 78, 76, and it pretty much flattens out right in here. Uh, you can see a holding. So this is the type of information you can get to, to quickly look at uh, topographical information. Uh, access to LIDAR. And again, working with LIDAR, that would be a whole separate workshop that might take a whole day. So I always say that you, from after this point, after you're doing the paper one, you got to do your field reconnaissance. Basically you're meeting with the landowner renter, you'll get a hold of location services in case there's any buried electric lines, gas, oil, rural water, etc. cetera. Uh, identify wetlands. If there are identified wetlands and then you're in the farm program, uh, the NRCS would have to calculate uh, a lateral effect distance, how far you'd have to stay away from them. And then just note basic boundary conditions, roads, culverts, so forth. Current surface drainage system, soil types, we already went over that, whether there may be salinity or sodium issues, where the high and low spots are, uh, and then the big important one is where's that water going to go if you drain the field? Usually it's going to go the same place that the surface runoff goes, but 
that's this becomes a very very important part of uh, drainage layout and design so in this case this is a red river valley field hardly any slope at all 2000 feet you can see it's at 10.6 there 10 there so you got about a six tenths of a foot drop across this field and the outlets over here so and there's a ditch there and, and note and you measure the bottom elevation so you know how much of a depth you got to work with if you're going to put a system on here uh, if you got a field like this you can quickly identify the outlet look at these topographic maps first thing off you look over here the ones close together you know that's steep so you don't have to go very far to go from 48 to 47 so this is a steep area of the field uh, and on topographic maps anything pointing downhill is a ridge anything pointing uphill is a is a swale so you got a ridge here a swale here yeah kind of a swale up through here and that's one of the secrets of looking at topographic maps. Just remember that ridges point downhill, swales point uphill, or ditches point uphill. So I recommend measuring a lot of these uh, these particular points, you know, potholes, uh, outlet elevations using RTK GPS is one way. You could do it the old fashioned way by surveying, but this works out pretty good. This Several years ago, we had a couple of students do a project with us and they were out surveying one of the fields on campus here for uh, uh, some of the wheat researchers. But they have a base station here and then the, the portable unit. And of course, this thing is the one that gets the accuracy and then feeds into this one. But you need that kind of accuracy in order to determine, especially on flatter fields, how much elevation you actually have to work with. And when we talk about elevation, we talk about rise over run or tile grade. So if this was the main and you're putting in a lateral, if there's a rise over the run, uh, we used to talk about tile grade and percent. So typically, for example, a 0.1% 1 .1 grade would be a one foot rise or drop in a thousand feet. We don't go by just the slope. We go by the by the grade. So 0.5% grade would be a five foot rise or drop in a thousand feet. And you can run into both of those uh, in the valley. And that, that affects how fast water moves uh, down the tile and to the, and this is where that, the question about the drainage coefficient, uh, the size of the main would, would be affected and uh, by the uh, flow uh, of the, so. Can you change grade? Obviously a lot of the newer systems on the tile plows allow you to uh, measure the elevation and then a lot of them have software that will automatically adjust the grade as long as you're continually going up. So you got a flatter grade here, a steeper grade here. What we don't want is these kind of things, because this is where sand accumulates, this is where water sits, this is affects the drainage. So uh, if you hit a rock or something else that's buried and it changes the grade, you have to, uh, or something affects it. Even I've been told that uh, your GPS can actually vary from day to day and be kind of off if you were plowing in, uh, from one day to the next. So this type of situation is we don't want. So grade control is extremely important to make sure if you want a long lasting tile system. And spacing, and this is where the uh, case act comes in is it's gonna allow us to calculate the correct spacing so that we have a situation like this. Like I showed you earlier, we don't want this where it doesn't drain in between. And so these, this crop gets uh, flooded for a period of time and affects its growth. So just to give you some 
general idea, if you look over here, you got clay loam, silty clay, silt loam, sandy loams. If you have a drainage coefficient of a quarter inch, you might have your tile spacing combined with your case set is, is going to be uh, wider because the case at the sandy loam, the water is going to move through the soil a lot faster uh, to remove the same amount of water under, you know, given conditions of, of a selected drainage coefficient. Three eighths, it, you can see there's a range from clay loam to sandy loams. And if you went to half inch, you can see that you're getting close, you're, you're getting closer together because you're removing more water in a 20, we're usually working on a one day idea uh, of uh, removing that amount of water. So this is an interesting looking formula and I don't, I'm sure a lot of you aren't care, uh, don't, you don't have to worry about it. I put it up here because I want to show you that the drainage coefficient is the amount of water we expect to infiltrate to drain out of the system. And the case at is this value. So one of them is for below the tile and one of them is for above the tile. Although a lot of people just assume that it's, it can be uniform between them, but you can calculate the spacing once you have this and you have this from your soils. And fortunately, uh, our colleague, when he was with uh, South Dakota State University, Dr. Chris Hay developed this real nice drainage calculator that will calculate a number of processes for you. I would suggest everybody attending today, go to this website and just check it out. Uh, but I'm gonna stop sharing and actually go there and we'll, we'll look at uh, This is the actual website. So if I wanna, if you see you got drain spacing, you can average hydraulic conductivity if you got two different, like I showed you in the one soil earlier. So let's go to the drain spacing. Whoop, there we are. So let me pull this out again. Okay, I think everybody can see that. So up here, you got your drainage coefficient and you can put in anything you want. I'm gonna put in, just for the heck of it, we'll put in, 0.375, which is three eighths of an inch. I'm gonna go with, uh, in this case, four inch tile. And we're gonna put it in at 3.5 feet. Now there's depth to restrictive layer. If you don't know, and it's usually really hard to determine, but we usually just assume that that clay layer that's keeping that water from going down is about 10 feet down. If you have better information, you can put in whatever it is. Uh, so if I put in 10, the minimum water table depth, uh, I don't want, when we're in full flow condition, I don't want that, that water table coming up between the tile to within a foot of the surface. So I'm gonna put in, that's the minimum water table depth between the tile. I put one there. And then hydraulic conductivity units, you can select whatever they come in. Uh, let's let's look at uh, feet per day, and so from looking this up in the soils, let's say we got one. You know, calculate and say for these conditions, the tile has to be forty nine feet apart. Uh, can it be fifty? Well, of course. Um, where these are all, uh, you know, we're kind of approximating some of these things that hydraulic conductivity value could be higher or lower, but generally this gets you into the ballpark. And uh, it's, it's also, um, it's very handy. You can change these values. If I went to three, three inch tile, it would be 48 feet. <sighs> It doesn't, uh, you can see it doesn't make a big, a lot of difference. What happens if you had this uh, restrictive layer at four feet though? Let's say it was just below your tile depth. 
Uh, you have to go closer together. Why? Because there's no flow underneath the tile, so it has to flow horizontally. And so you have to be closer together to remove that amount of water, that three point, this amount of water in a day. And again, this is a design point. So, so that's, this is a very, very handy. I'd encourage everybody to go there and just kind of check out the different ones. Uh, Chris did a nice job all the way down. You can fall to grade, a grade to fall, uh, area drain, pipe sizes. So, so if, if I go back to here, just showing you that as you go deeper in depth, the spacing gets wider. Why is that? Well, assuming that you're the area between a tile, you want to keep it level. The head differential is gets greater as you get down deeper. So therefore the water can push through faster so you can go wider. So you can four foot 62, all things, all else being equal. So the shallower you are, the closer you got to be together and so forth. So to finish this up, uh, tile sizing. So we use, a, there's an equation called Manning's. Uh, and I, I put the formula up here because you can calculate the flow rate in tile, the maximum flow rate using this formula. And I wanted to point out that N here is a roughness factor. And so uh, the, this is the diameter of the tile, inside diameter. Of course, divide by 12, uh, compare it to feet. And this will calculate the flow rate in cubic feet per second. So this can be, there's a number of nomographs and other things out there that will calculate this for you um, for a given amount of area, how much how this is used to help size the amount of tile, size tile you need to, to move the water over a from, from a given size field. So. Um, in the class, we use a, a principal slide rule, uh, but all the manufacturers have a slide rule like this and basically solves that equation for you. And the nice thing about it is you can see the slide sticking out over here. And what I've done is I've set three eighths of an inch drainage coefficient to 80 acres. The drainage coefficient is here. I put 80 acres in there and then if you're using single wall, it, it would tell you for what grade, what size pipe you could use. So of course, as the percent grade increases, the pipe size decreases because it can handle more flow. So if you're on a 0.1% grade, you would need a 15 inch pipe to handle that maximum design flow out of 80 acres at a 0.1%. So we also have a, uh, a spacing calculator spreadsheet from Iowa State that we can send people. Uh, does the same thing, although you can just, it's a, it's a Excel file, so you wouldn't have to go online. You can do it on your computer. Uh, but in the interest of time, I, got, I already, uh, you heard me talk. <laughs> I, I apologize for that. It, on my screen, it looks the same, but anyway, so the deeper you go, the wider you can go on drain spacing for given, for all, all things being equal because you got more head to work with to push water into deeper. So as you go deeper, you can go wider. Uh, that's just a, uh, a fact of uh, tile fl flow through uh, soil. So, and this is the equation I was talking about. It's Manning's equation. You can calculate the flow rate through a tile at different diameters based on grade and roughness coefficient. So, and you can see this good, right, Hans? Yes. So anyway, here's the, uh, the drainage coefficient. I got three eighths of an inch up here. You can see the slide out here on the slide rule. I set it at 80. And then down here, you got 0.1% slope and you need a 15 inch tile all the way up to 0.2%. But once you got up to 0.3, you could use 12 inch. 
if you're using a dual wall for a portion on this 80 acres near the outlet, you can see that that 0.1% slope or just above it, you could get by with a 12 inch. So why is that? Because dual wall inside is, is a plastic, it's not furled, so it, it doesn't present as much resistance to water flow. We also have down here, uh, they put on there, the, if you got four inch pipe size, uh, you got 10, uh, 10 uh, rows on it, coil lengths, 3,000 feet. So that's a handy feature to determine uh, how many feet of tile you got, five inch. And this is, of course, that's Princo. I don't know if all the manufacturers follow that same, but that's it. Gives you the gives you a pretty good idea, a, a quick idea of how much is in a coil. This is the backside of the slide, where you can put into percent grade, and then just look across here and pick off real quickly what the flow rates are. So, at 0.1 percent grade, when the tile's flown full, the uh, it would be about 0 0.52 cubic feet per second. There's 450 gallons a minute in a cubic foot per second. So, I, and I don't know why they didn't put gallons on here, but you can you can see that the carrying capacity, of course, increases with the size of the tile. Uh, and again, this is calculated for full tile flow. And if you have dual wall, you can look at the same thing and and uh, see what the what the uh, flow rate is for that. You can also pick off the velocities down here. Um, so too bad we aren't in class. I could. So the topics and tools we covered today was that was a real quick run through is how water enters tile. Uh, that preliminary site evaluation, really looking at the soils, trying to get an idea what the KSAT values are, uh, drainable amount, clay sand fractions. So there is a question on that one, uh, Tom. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, if you have a lot of variability in KSAT uh, values within a field, uh, would that then affect your design? Yes, it would. Um, the, as I showed on that example, when I went to Google Earth, that uh, middle of the field, the KSATs there were pretty sandy. So in that part, you probably could have, you know, they, the KSATs, if I remember right, were somewhere around uh, 33 uh, of the units that they had. And then when you went over in the far right next to the road there in that soil type, the KSAT was three. So that would definitely in those areas that would change your spacing if you had variable case sets like that. And that's why you need to do that preliminary check. Is that okay? Yep. Then of course the topographic features are the biggest thing. Uh, you can get them online, but you still have to go out and survey some of these uh, like the outlet and Ditch, ditch bottoms and so forth to make sure that you have a pretty accurate uh, evaluation. And then uh, once you go to the field and site, you can, you can take a paper copy of the map with you or whatever, or, or on an iPad and, and mark up these topographic maps to note these where there might be uh, things that, that don't show up on, on the paper. And then oh. we talk about tile grades, spacing, and sizing. So those are yeah. the tools you might use. Mm -hmm.